The Lollygaggers podcast would like to say hello to friend and fan of the show Walter Koenig, known for his iconic role as Chekhov in Star Trek, but also as the leader of the Soviet Union during the 1980s. This joke will make sense later. On this episode, Justin plays the adult by watching HBO's Chernobyl, while Jeff plays a board game called Too Many Bones. In the Gentleman's Challenge, we ask for a refund from Room of the World, but watch the perfect movie in Streets of Fire. Welcome to episode 56 of the Lollygaggers podcast, the show about all sorts of different things, from comics to games, movies to TV. I am one of your hosts, Jeff. I'm the other one, Justin. How's it going, buddy? Uh, not great for Swamp Thing, so I feel like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we cursed it. So episode 54, Justin challenged me to watch an episode of Swamp Thing, and you know what I did? I totally forgot to cancel my DCU. So I have it for a month now, so I guess I'm going to watch Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol! Yeah, so anyway, if you haven't heard the news, Swamp Thing is already canceled, got canceled after one episode, but not because it was like doing bad. It actually was getting relatively good reviews, including our own. We were both very positive on it. But apparently there was some sort of like tax thing or whatever, and they ended up not getting as much back from North Carolina as they were supposed to. At least that's what I heard. I'm not sure if that's even accurate. We're they not lost news. like millions of dollars. Yeah, that's a bummer. I mean, if it, if you have to lose millions of dollars to get such great, uh, uh, you know, monster falling apart because your various vines and limbs aren't working, uh, I mean, I, I think you should lose the money. I think it's money well worth lost. So yeah, 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 yeah. Did you watch the second episode? Uh, I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, neither I was, have I. I. I've been kind of been watching a whole bunch of stuff, uh, including what I'm talking about today. That's transition right there. Right, right, right. right. I was going to ask you about E3 first, actually, before we transition there. Oh, okay, we, because E3 was all... Ask me that question later, then. So anyway, did you watch e- any E3? I know you were gone, but like, did you watch any um, E3? Not much, but I got like the gist of it. There's a couple things I'm excited for, like the new Ori game. I think it'll be fun to play. Um, Cyberpunk looks really cool. Yeah. Um, Beyond Good and Evil, I have no excitement for that at all because I what? have zero connection to that original franchise. Oh, all. the game was so good. Oh, man. Oh, whatever. Anyway. But, uh, I mean, Sony wasn't there, so you miss a lot of stuff there because they think of it as a pointless venture now. It's really, really interesting what's going on with them in E3 and what's happening with E3. Hmm. But uh, there's not a ton of stuff I'm super excited for. I, uh, the new Doom game, I because of that, I've decided to buy the old one and play it. It was and on I sale, I think. Yeah, it was on sale. Yeah, it's like fifteen percent off on Steam right now. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I'm kind of excited to play that. And then um, other than that, nothing terribly exciting that I saw. I was like, oh, I can't wait for that. It wasn't really that exciting because the problem is like next year they'll be unveiling all the new consoles, so they're waiting for all their big stuff for next year. So that's kind of sure. what's going on. I think there's some big big announcements. I mean, like the Cyberpunk stuff, Encounter Reeves stuff, all that's pretty cool. Uh, you already mentioned that, but like I'm excited about two things. They're both based upon tabletop role playing games that are also uh, video games. So one was Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines Two. Uh, I love. Okay, so even if you don't, even if you never played Vampire the Masquerade, the tabletop RPG, uh, even if you never played that, there is this great game from the uh, from like kind of the early to mid aughts, two thousands, uh, called Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. It's a fantastic, absolutely fantastic game, and I, I recommend anyone get it because. I mean, yeah, the graphics are somewhat dated, but it's still a really, really good game with a lot of choice, and you basically play a vampire, right? And so the sequel is finally coming out, and they actually showed some not just not just like hype trailers, but actual gameplay, and so that looks really cool. So I'm kind of excited about that. And then the other one, and this one was huge, and this one was kind of out of nowhere, Baldur's Gate 3, man. Uh, Baldur's Gate is based upon, uh, you know, D&D franchises, so... Back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there's, you know, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, and then there was going to be a sequel for Baldur's Gate 3, but it kind of fell apart. And finally, we're getting a Baldur's Gate 3, but that's not all. It's being done by Larian Studios. It's the same, same people who did, like, the Divinity game that you, uh, you, me, and our friend Wobbly keep trying to play but never finish. And so I hate you guys yeah. for never <laughs> letting me play that game because I really want to finish that game. Uh, but I did play the first, uh, but the second, we, we constantly start and restart because we can never get our schedules together. And it's going to be D and D fifth edition uh, rule set, so that's really cool. And if that's not enough, the other cool thing that Mike Merle is uh, one of the lead the, the lead directors of uh, of actual tabletop D and D fifth edition. Uh, he he was saying that it's a prequel. Excuse me, that the next uh, adventure module for D and D fifth edition, which is coming out in September, called Descent into Avernus, is a prequel, direct prequel to the events that's going to transpire in Baldur's Gate three. So now, me and Coder, come up, a couple of our other players, were actually thinking about maybe running that module. Uh, later this year to kind of ramp up towards the release of Baldur's Gate 3. So pretty exciting, if you ask me. 
uh, which you did. So that's why I answered. So yeah, anyway, well, yeah. So, uh, so you know, did you did you happen to watch uh, any more of Swamp Thing uh, in in the time that you were not watching E3? No, but I did binge watch some other stuff, including what I'm talking about this week. That's where we got. We're back on track. Back on track. So uh, I I watched the entirety of Chernobyl. And have you watched Chernobyl? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, it's on my to do list. Um, yeah, it's what six episode miniseries. I think it's got Jared Harris and I. Or yeah, Jared Harris. Yeah. I love that guy so much. He was in uh he was in the Terror, which I which I talked about many yeah, 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 many yeah. many episodes ago. So I love that guy. So it's created by Craig Martin. So this creator also was the main writer for The Hangover Two, and Identity Thief, and The Huntsman. So you know you're getting quality TV out of this, <laughs> which is because this show is amazing and all the other garbage you made in the past it doesn't make sense so whatever anyways um so it starts well i mean Hazen like today. the hangover wasn't trash like it was pretty hangover funny two. i didn't say hangover, oh, hangover, hangover two. two is hangover two is that the one where they now they it's don't just hangover one just again again okay yeah okay That's all, of it. all right so it stars jared harris like you said stellan skarsgård and jesse buckley um, one of the things I do for art direction in this show is no one has like a Boris and Natasha uh, voice because it takes place in uh, Pripyat, uh, Russia in Chernobyl. And so like the director was like, yeah, I don't want everyone to sound ridiculous. So we'll all just use their normal voices, which is fine for like 80% of the show. But like at a certain point, like, I think it's like episode four or five. There's an actor that comes in that has a, just an American accent. So like it's all British actors to a certain point, And then all of a sudden, American accent. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of weird. But anyways, despite that, it's great. Um, the acting in the show is phenomenal. I think Stellan Skarsgård did the best job out of anyone in the show. Some of the, the speeches he does, they does in the show are just phenomenal. Jared Harris has, a, in the last episode, there's a trial. He has a, a, a just a great monologue where he's explaining what happened with the reactor and everything like that. He, he's just unbelievable. Um, and so, based on the story of Chernobyl, if you don't really understand what it is, is back in 1986 this actually took place like two months before i was born which is really weird um so maybe um the explosion of that uh nuclear reactor created this monster that you see today uh but so what happened was is they were running a test in chernobyl and the reactor exploded now the way reactors work i became somewhat of a an educated human being after the show, understanding how actual nuclear fission works. Um, uh, so the way it kind of works, it, it it creates energy and disperses energy in a way that it it has a fail safe where it can't break, where like you can't have situations where a nuclear reactor can explode. It, it it's it's impossible the way it's set up, which is why it's very clean and very uh, like I'd say uh, riskless energy that's made. Um, because all it does is just create steam and there's no like burning of fossil fuels. It's just the expulsion of neutrons from uh, a, a, a highly radioactive material. So what happened was there was an explosion in the core. And after this explosion, it basically then becomes for the first three episodes, almost like a zombie show, but it's all real and it's insane just how much cover up and disregard for people's health in the area that the Soviet Russia had, because the whole idea behind it, the whole reason that they kind of like brushed it under the rug is, and one of the best lines from the show is the perception of power is where we get our power. So the whole idea of if they admitted that they screwed up in any way, shape or form, they're losing the strength that they bring forward to the world. And later in the movie, at the end, they're talking about um, uh, Chekhov. Not Chekhov. That's the guy from Star Trek. Uh, yeah. Uh, also a, a writer, but yeah, that's fine. Uh, the the he was a prime minister at the time with a stain on his head. What's his name again? Uh, <laughs> uh, you mean Gorbachev? You the do, do you mean yeah, Gorbachev? Gorbachev. Gorbachev. Chekhov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Anton Chekhov. Yeah. Uh, he he mentioned you know at the end of the show they have like little like um ex explanations like how it all ended and stuff like that and like showed real footage and stuff and they said that gorbachev said that the chernobyl incident is one of the leading reasons of the soviet union's fall in the 80s and 
it kind of makes a lot of sense because they basically for for what happened is they cut corners and use a different material to do what they did and that's why the explosion happened but it's just crazy it's insane how many and the fact that it's real how many just human beings they just throw at this thing and it's like you know what they'll be fine um and it's just the level of radiation like a big problem was so when it first starts off and there's an explosion i think it's just a fire and they get, they get our, their rad readers out and they're like, well, it only goes to 3.6. Well, the only reason it goes to 3.6 is because their readers only go that high. And then they bring some stuff from out outside and say, oh, no, it's not possible. Like, the, that stuff must be broken. And then they realize, like, it's, it's not that high. People would be fine. It's just like getting a, an x ray. They're like, no, it's like people getting like 3,000 x rays. And it's just insane how much, how slow they fix the situation, how they fix the situation, how one shit situation led to another shit situation just back-to-back problems and how they just kind of cover it all up and it's, it's insane and when you watch it you realize it's it's real it's a real thing that happened and they mentioned at the end of the movie like the official soviet russia death toll of what happened during the whole thing was 31 people but they estimate now that all the information has been come out that 31,000 people died as a result to this stuff. The whole show was great. Um, only thing that upsets me, and it would upset you too, is that I think it's like episode four or five. One of the problems that they had, they had to hire people for was people were evacuated from Chernobyl. So they left all their pets. So there's a whole sequence, a whole like really upsetting thing where there's uh soldiers that are hired just to go out and kill domestic pets because if they leave then they'll affect the rest of the country so they basically go out there and try and eradicate all the domestic pets that are there so there's some really rough stuff with that but other than that the entire show is just i found myself just glued to it the entire time i got all six episodes done in like two days it was just unbelievable and 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 jared harris just astonishingly a good actor and the Stellan Skarsgård, I you know I like him as the uh, the 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 guy from Thor, uh, and also all of his children are just super handsome, you know. But he well, did a tremendous. Well, isn't isn't the son of his that's on Vikings? Uh, isn't he play like he plays Loki's and he's kind of he's kind of um, he's he's odd looking. I thought that was him. Yeah, yeah. maybe like it's like I think yeah. they're all. I think he's got like four sons. One mm. of the sons this is one of the sons. It. And the other one's the one yes. from True Blood. Yes, yes, yeah. So like, he's got three out of four are just amazingly handsome. You know, so I think he's got a good track record. So uh, <laughs> I uh, I highly suggest you watch it. I didn't I didn't spoil a ton of stuff. Just there's so much stuff that goes on with this that's really hard to spoil anything because it's just minute after minute of revelation of what happened that just blows your mind. Like, oh my god! So it's on HBO. Watch it as soon as you can. It's a little bit slow, but it's it's like a real life human zombie story. It's just nuts. Like people, something happens to someone, you're like, oh, that person's dead. They're they're going to die. It's a matter of time. These people are marked for death, almost like if they're bit by a zombie, and if the other people get in contact with them, those people are dead too. It's just nutty. And it's just unbelievable. So Chernobyl can't say enough about it. Watch it. All right, so very similarly, I also uh, tackled something incredibly serious and historical uh, by playing a board game about very large-eared gnomes uh, that are rafting up a river. Uh, so it's kind of the same thing. It's really it's yeah, so, sort of thing. like sort of like a sociological study about I don't know what I'm talking about. This is a really goofy game, but it's a, a really good game that I want to talk about. It's called Too Many Bones Undertow. Uh, now, Too Many Bones is a larger uh, a larger game. It's a, more like a game system to some degree, and so there's all sorts of different versions of it. I have Undertow. There's like the core game, which was originally just too many bones. More recently, there was a slice and dice Kickstarter. Uh, but there's there's different versions of it. But I got to the kind of the affordable one because it's kind of an expensive game. But it's called Too Many Bones Undertow, and it's published by Chip Theory Games, who's a company I've talked about before uh, many many episodes ago. Last uh, last fall, I talked about a game called Cloud Spire that was up on Kickstarter that I was uh, thinking about backing, and I ended up I did end up backing as well. And I also got a hold of Too Many Bones Undertow as well because I really like some of the production quality that I was seeing. And I was hearing great word of mouth about the games themselves. 
Uh, this is designed by Adam Carlson and Josh Carlson, the latter of whom also does some of the art. Uh, and it is Undertow is specifically a one to two player cooperative game, but if you get some of the other the other either expansions or the other base sets, you can play uh, one to four. It's still going to be cooperative, uh, but you can change the, the player count. My wife and I play it. We really enjoy it. It's a cooperative fantasy game, and you play as a group of gear locks. That's the name of like the specific uh, species or race that you uh, that you're playing. Um, they're kind of like I said, they're like big eared gnomes uh, in a way, maybe a little bit taller than gnomes, kind of like half gnome, half maybe elf, something like that. Uh, and so in this one, you're you're traveling up a river on a raft, uh, or you're traveling over land in some cases, and you're looking to fight a series of baddies, and that's what they're actually called, baddies, so they're just basic enemies. Uh, and then there's also a tyrant. So every single time you play, you pick a tyrant, which is a really strong baddie, like the big bad boss that you want to play against, and that's and they're up to no good, and so that's who you pick, and that's who you want to fight. Uh, and then and there's all sorts of kind of weird, goofy, tongue-in-cheek types of uh, types of baddies, like really giant giant apes and stuff like that, and, and silly things. Um, so it's got a really nice uh, light feel to it. It's not like super serious and super dark like some of the other games I play. It's not like a Kingdom Death Monster or anything like that. It's very light, um, at least in, in terms of its brightness of theme. <laughs> it's heavy in other regards. Uh, but the the whole idea of the game is that it's a sing- it's like a it's a single it's not really a, a campaign style game though there is like there are campaign there's like campaign rules but it's still very short it's very quick in the sense that um, you don't really play for that long or it's not like a legacy game or a really long dungeon crawl or like uh, any of the other types of games you might play like a descent or imperial assault where you might be playing for like weeks on end this is something you can probably get through in a night uh, we actually split our campaign which was just like killing three tyrants like three bosses in a row between two nights and we got it done pretty quick um so it's a, like i said it's a cooperative fantasy game and it is all about tactical combat uh now the game itself it takes place primarily on a series of mats uh the, the, they're these neoprene mats that have these die cutouts uh where you can put on your like each each player gets the mat of a specific gear lock that they're playing and then there's also the central kind of combat board um, which is again another another neoprene mat, so kind of like the like a really nice uh, mouse pad. And on that central board, you move these poker chips around because the poker chips designate or like they designate who's your ally, who are you, who's your, you know, who are you fighting against. But also that you stack up the amount of chips you have as well, the amount of health. And so it's really cool. So, so you're constantly moving around like stacks of chips, and the top chip is always like your character or the enemies. And the chips are there's really nice artwork on it. It's super high quality. It looks a lot different. There's no other games. I've ever seen that like anything like this. Most games that I play that are similar to this have miniatures, and I have to paint those, and so it's really nice and refreshing for me not to have to do that, uh, and so I can just kind of play with this cool little chip artwork. Uh, and so the the map isn't very big, and it's not uh, particularly uh, evocative. Like there's some basic art on it, but it's not very large, and it's just a grid, uh, and it's very much like you know, kind of like a almost like a little Final Fantasy Tactics thing going on there, where like you move around on the grid and you fight different different baddies, and so. The way, the way the game is played is that it's played over a series of days as you're trying to quest and find this tyrant who's doing something bad out in the world. And every single day, uh, which is essentially a round, you draw an encounter card, you read it, there's a little bit of the story. It's not a ton of story, but a little bit. This isn't an incredibly story-heavy game, but it's got a little bit, a little flavor, a little theme. And then it gives you a choice, some sort of situation. And you and your, your playing compatriots, or if you're playing solo, have to make a decision. Like, how do you want to deal with this situation? Some of those, some of those decisions, some choices will lead to combat. Some won't. Uh, some will lead to further discovery, where you'll add like other encounter cards. Like there's this one really cool series of chained encounters where my wife and I explored this like underground lab that was kind of fun. Uh, but others are just straight up combat, and like you, you might choose between like an easier combat or a harder combat. Like maybe one choice will allow you to ambush whoever it is you're fighting against. Another one, not so. Uh, and that'll kind of dictate how the grid's set up. And so then you follow some basic instructions on how to set up the board. Like who is it going to be on the raft side of the mat? So where that you might be dealing uh, with some water-based enemies, or is it going to be on the overland side where you might be dealing with just beasts and, and stuff, or maybe even some mechs or the stuff like that. Uh, and so you set that up based upon how many baddies are in this fight. So how many enemies, uh, and then over the course, depending upon the difficulty of the day or something like that, you might have reinforcements that come in over the course of time. And then over a series of rounds in combat, you and your playing compatriot, you uh, you fight the baddies and you, you do various things. Now the combat is, I think, really where the game shines because this game is all a, rewards repeated plays because it's not the easiest game to get into right away because each 
gear lock plays massively different from another. Uh, they are nowhere close to the same. Uh, now, the way a actual mat works for a single character is that there's, again, there's a, all sorts of these little squares that have been cut out. And you have uh, basically four stats. You have health, you have dexterity, you have attack, and you have defense. Uh, and then you have a series of skill die. And now the skill die is kind of like uh, like talents, maybe from a different uh, from a different game or just special abilities that over the course of your 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 game you can you can acquire experience points and you can purchase things that go in those slots on your mat. You can also increase your health, you can increase your attack, you can increase your defense or your dex, or, or you can just buy new skills. So, for instance, I play the character called Tink. Tink is from an expansion; it's just a separate expansion where you just play him by himself. Now, Tink is a gear lock. He's an older gear lock who likes to make little bots, little mechanical bots that he summons or he, he kind of deploys into the battlefield and he gets them to do his bidding, right? And so that's the guy I was playing, which was so much fun. To like, So I'm sitting there on my mat, I'm building a bot and I'm dropping a little bot down and then I build another one, I drop another one. So I'm basically playing Heimerdinger from League of Legends, who's one of my favorite characters to play. So it was super fun. Whereas my wife was playing Duster, who is one of the base characters from Undertow, and she is more of an like a kind of an assassiny stealth type person. Not stealth, that's not the right word, but more like an assassin, roguish type character, but who also has a pet, a uh, pet wolf, who will show up to defend her if she ever starts to take damage. So there were times when we actually had both of our pets on the board at the same time, and we really were able to start surrounding these different baddies. Um, now you can build your character in all sorts of different ways because. Part of building your character is purchasing all sorts of different die. Uh, and now these, um, excuse me, uh, different dice. And all of these dice uh, have, you know, are related to your specific skills. And then over the course of the game, you might upgrade them and you might get like a better version of that skill. Um, so if you've ever seen any kind of kind of split, you know, kind of branching off kind of skill tree in any other game, it, that's kind of what this is, except it uses dice for that. Now, not all of these skills require you to actually ever roll those dice. In many cases, like with me, I almost never rolled dice. I really just placed the dice the way I wanted to because of how I was upgrading my my, my bots because like the dice were actually my bots, whereas my wife would actually have to roll a lot of hers uh, because sometimes there were like special attacks and things like that. So the game has, the, the base game that we have, Undertow, has two characters uh, called Stanza, who's like a bard, and then Duster. And then there's other games, uh, like Too Many Bones, the base game has four other characters. And then there's a handful of expansions that are just basically character expansions. Uh, and the, we have like one that's Gasket, who's like this giant mech. Uh, we have Gilly, who's like a ranger. And there's a couple others here and there. But every single every single gear arc plays vastly differently. And it's so cool kind of just sitting there and figuring out how you're, how you're going to play your character. Like me, am I going to be, am I going to make my bot super offensive? Because I can start customizing how I build them. Do I put like extra weaponry on them do i make them into a ranged bot where they're just like they're firing artillery from a distance or do i make them more like a tank where they're just sitting there to, to sort of sponge hits and that's kind of what i i tend to prefer to build them as uh and so there's different ways you can do that and in some cases you don't necessarily have to build too many pieces onto your bots you might just instead use them in different ways right now i won't get i won't like break down the combat too much but i will say that the vast majority of this game is about doing these com combats right like so that's really what this game is for so if you're if you're the type of person who really likes playing uh kind of, kind of tactical stuff that's somewhat you know somewhat deterministic but there is randomness because you do have to roll some dice you roll attack dice and defense dice but the cool thing is that even if you even if you miss your attacks uh your misses can still contribute to other things you have this thing called a backup plan so every time you miss you get like you know a miss on, on an attack die it looks like a, a like a, a series of or an x like an x made of bones you add that uh, to a spot on your on your player mat that builds up your backup plan, which can over the series over, over the the course of a, of a combat, you can then use those those misses to then power up some other special kind of attack or an ability. In my case, I could uh, bring out another bot, or I could hit them with a big old hammer, like a big old wrench that I'm carrying around. So there's all sorts of things. So it's really cool how just missing isn't the end of the world because there's still other ways that you can do things. And I always really like how games don't it's not just about you it's not just so binary like either miss or you hit it's more you can hit you can miss and be able to do something else with it and that's kind of fun and so i really really like that um so the game i would also say is kind of expensive uh the cool thing about undertow is that it's a little bit more affordable i know that the base game of undertow or excuse me the base game of too many bones is like 120 something bucks uh because there's tons of really high quality high quality components 
Uh, they're really known for their chips. They're called chip theory games. So it makes sense that they're using these like poker chips to designate all sorts of different, um, different aspects to their games. But they also come with their own like little inserts. So like they have like chip containers, these really high quality chip containers. So it's super cool and super easy to keep all your components kind of organized, which is Again, something that they're really well known for is that they're high quality components. The artwork is fantastic. They even have high quality box art as well. Like on the interior, it's not just like basic cardboard, which a lot of board games do. They really go the extra mile. Uh, and they have little like cushion cutout spaces where you can put like your cards and they even give you card decks, like little boxes that you can actually put your encounter cards and stuff in. So everything kind of just goes the extra mile to kind of bling out the game, uh, which is really, really nice. Uh, they just did Slice and Dice Kickstarter, which just wrapped up like a week ago. Unfortunately, Justin was out of town, so we weren't recording. So um, they might allow some late pledges. I'm not sure what their what their uh, what their rules are on that. Uh, but I know that Chip Theory Games website, ChipTheoryGames.com, uh, actually sells a lot of their stuff as well. None of the stuff is Kickstarter exclusive. So even if you miss a Kickstarter, you'll always be able to get some of their content. They only sell really from either their Kickstarters or from their website. So this isn't, some, this isn't something you're probably ever going to find in a, in a local game store or on a coolstuff.com or on a miniature market.com or something like that. So you kind of have to go directly through them. So they're a small company. They do some really cool things. I'm really enjoying the game, and I can't wait for Cloudspire, which is, should be coming in the next month or two. So I'll probably be talking about Chip Theory games again uh, in the near future. So Too Many Bones, Undertow. Take a look, especially if you like cooperative uh in-depth tactical combat with a lot of like rewarding asymmetrical gameplay like really good stuff on that note i think uh we're good for our uh our little banter stuff or whatever the hell we call this segment and it's time to move on to the gentleman's challenge and now it's time for the gentleman's challenge So the Gentleman's Challenge is a segment we do here on the Lollygaggers podcast where Justin and I like to give each other homework assignments. Then in order to ensure that we complete those homework assignments, we come back on the next episode and we quiz each other about it. Now, these homework assignments tend to be watching a movie or a couple episodes of a TV show, maybe playing a game, something like that. Uh, and then what we do during our discussion is we spoil the hell out of it and we tell you what we think. Uh, so if there's something we're talking about in today's episode uh, that you don't want to be spoiled about yet, you want to experience it yourself, we encourage you to do that and then maybe come back and listen to what we thought about it and see if our thoughts match up. Uh, and so, Justin, I think I want to start. Uh, I, I know that it's probably your turn, but I think I want to start because I want to get Rim of the World out of the way so that we can really just sort of end strong with Streets of Fire. Of course. Rim, <laughs> Rim of the World is what Justin tasked me with watching a couple weeks ago. And I did watch it a couple weeks ago, so uh, I'm probably going to fail the hell on my quiz. Now, this is directed by Mick G, uh, who is known for his work on Terminator uh, Salvation. He did the Charlie's Angel remake. And, uh, and I mean, I'm, obviously, Justin, you know that he did the, the all-star music video for Smash Mouth. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Mick he, also did, he also did one for Sugar Ray, too. So, anyway, it's Mick G. Uh, now, it's written by Zach Stentz, uh, who has some, as I was going through his IMDb page, uh, he has some other very interesting writing credits, uh, which include uh, a series of Fringe episodes, which is really cool because I love Fringe, excellent show. He also uh, also has a Terminator connection because he did some work on the, uh, the the Terminator show called Sarah Connor Chronicles. Uh, we did a series of episodes. Uh, very decent show. I thought that was pretty solid. Uh, and um, and he was a uh, staff writer on the Lolly Gaggers podcast favorite uh, Andromeda, starring uh, starring Kevin Sorbo, who I who I challenged Justin to do this. Uh, and now I'm not sure how I feel about this one because he's writing the screenplay uh, for the Big Trouble in Little China remake, right? Uh -oh. Right. Now Big Trouble is one of my all time favorite movies. I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's so good. Uh, may the bird, may the, may the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Anyway. Uh, but it's one of my all-time favorites, so I'm really hoping that we get the Zack Stentz who worked on Thor and X-Men First Class and not the Zack Stentz who worked on Agent Cody Banks and the Rim of the World screenplays because I... Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, a little bit on Zack Stentz. So uh, Rim of the World, it is uh, it's on Netflix. It's a Netflix uh, movie. It's about an hour and a half or so, but it feels longer. Uh, and it's a movie built on kind of similar bones as like uh, like Goonies or Super 8 or Stranger Things. It's, it's about a group of young kids each of them dealing with their own kind of personal problems and issues and insecurities, all uh, all with the backdrop of some crazy adventure. And in this case, we're dealing with an alien invasion. OK, so that's that's the premise. That's the weird stuff. Now, Rim of the World, the title, that's not just the title of the movie, but it's also the name of the summer camp where these kids are headed 
uh, in the hills slash mountains slash forests near Los Angeles or something like that, somewhere in California. Uh, I don't know exactly what those mountains or that place might be called. I can't remember. But anyway, they exist somewhere because that's where they were. Now, shortly after all the kids arrive at the camp, they head out and do some canoeing. They do some other things first, but that's not really important. And then aliens that we originally saw at the very beginning of the movie attacking a space station in the opening scene start having a dogfight uh, with the Air Force of the U.S. military, and people get separated. And so then the movies then focus on four specific kids that become separated from the rest of the camp followers. And so give you a quick little rundown. There's Alex, who is played by Jack Gore, and his father uh, sadly died uh, recently in a fire that where he was like kind of actually saved Alex. Uh, and so Alex has been having a lot of trouble overcoming his fears and sort of engaging with anyone in the real world and really just dealing with the death of his dad. Uh, then there's Zenzen, who is played by Maya uh, Maya Czech. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And she's traveled a very, very long way, uh, which doesn't really make sense, but whatever, to visit this location uh, that she found on a port- uh, on a, on a postcard. She has this little like postcard or like this little advertisement that has like this landmark. And it's got like the Rim of the World stuff on it. And so she wanted to come here. She also has a father who wanted a son. And so that's what she's dealing with. And we really don't get a whole lot more, lot more depth about her than that. There's Darius, uh, who is played by Benjamin Flores Jr., and he is a pain in the ass, uh, to be honest. Uh, he talks, like, all the time, and he complains. He thinks he's hot uh, hot stuff, uh, but ultimately he's just a guy who really just whines throughout the entire movie uh, whenever he is tasked with actually having to do anything or confront anything. Uh, so it gets really annoying after a while, but uh, we start to learn throughout the course of the movie that he's really just kind of putting on a front, right, and that his this over over amount is overconfidence that he displays is really because his dad's going to jail and he's supposed to be rich but at the same time like they're bankrupt because their dad and and his car dealership did some bad stuff and so his dad's now going to jail so he's sort of overcompensating but still doesn't change the fact that for the vast majority of the movie he's kind of annoying uh then there's gabriel uh who's a kid that they randomly find in the woods uh while they're wandering on off and away from the other canoers and uh he seems like a decent guy he's bad with he's bad with numbers that's that'll be important later uh, but he's otherwise a decent dude except for the fact that he wears khakis uh while uh, hiking uh and he seems uh, uh super put together for what we learned later is a runaway and he likes to tuck his button down into a shirt and i just or into his uh, into his khakis and it just he was way too put together for me anyway these 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 are the four main players right and so they get separated uh from the other camp people because they're all kind of going to go canoeing or whatever and then when they return to the canoe site, and then later after this to the campgrounds, they own, they find that the horribly inept camp employees couldn't be bothered to do a head count, uh, and they just left four kids out in the wilderness because like even if there wasn't an alien invasion happening, that would still be incredibly awful. Uh, but there's an alien invasion happening, and they just let these four kids wander all by themselves, whatever. Uh, so anyway, that really frustrated me. Uh, so the kids, uh, as they're kind of retreating back to uh, the, the main campgrounds, They watch an escape pod from the space station I previously mentioned crash land near them because that's, of course, Uh, and inside of it, an uh, an astronaut lady crawls out. And it's the same astronaut woman that we saw at the very beginning. Uh, And she gives them a key that's going to help, like, the military, like, I guess, uh, be able to target and track the alien mothership that they're unable right now to target. And so there's some sort of specific doctor and passcode and a key. And she tells them all those three things and says, go find this guy someplace in L.A. This is the only thing. And then she gets attacked and killed uh, by an alien who's got multiple arms, more than two, uh, really big muscles, seems basically indestructible, can kind of regen- regenerate even if he takes a bunch of damage. And um, once once he has the scent of his target or its target, um, won't relent so it'll constantly be coming after you and so it was chasing this astronaut from space um so it kills the astronaut makes some kind of pet dog alien from some goo Uh, i didn't really understand how that worked uh and then tries to kill the kids because sure uh and then the kids use this drunken camp employee that was also left behind uh, as a distraction to get away from uh the big old alien and they ride down the the mountain on bikes to a sheriff's department inside of which they find some creepy dude locked up and only him literally nobody else in this whole police slash sheriff's departments it's just him and he's really creepy and alex decides to let him go for reasons right and i guess we learn later like a couple minutes later that the reason is to allow for an incredibly odd and unnecessary scene where this creepy guy shows up uh like four hours later in the evening with a bunch of his creepy fins and they're all wearing serial killer masks and they're threatening kids with guns because you know that makes sense right now when there's an alien invasion going on 
and they really want that key because of course they want to sell it and make profit because that makes sense because the world's over but whatever anyway the alien shows up kills those creepy dudes or you know distracts them enough gabriel traps the alien in a swimming pool in a very clever way uh, and then they move. Now, I get a lot of the events of this movie a little bit out of order because uh, it's been a little bit. But there's a couple other important scenes. So at one point, they crash for the night. They try to get some sleep uh, at Gabriel's house. Uh, and he returns there even though he's a runaway and because he got in trouble because he, he messed up at the at – the, the, like his parents like run a grocery store or something like that. And he was running the cash register. And he has trouble with numbers. And so he got yelled at. And so he ran away. He didn't want to deal with it. I think he got – I think he went to juvie or something like that. Uh, so, so anyway, they, uh, they go and they crash there and then like the three boys argue over who gets to sleep with Zen Zen and it's really, really creepy and gringy about as bad as you would probably think it would be. And they quote, decide not to, or excuse me, they decide not to quote cock block Alex, uh, who apparently has the best chance with her. So he and Zen Zen, uh, share a bed, uh, while the other two share a bed in the same room. Uh, so I really don't understand whether that was going to happen because they were all in the same room but whatever uh and then at another point and again i don't really remember the order of events they find some military dudes and it looks like they're saved but there's like 50 minutes left in the movie so you know they're not really safe because seconds later an alien attacks and the very nice military man who they gave the key to and he was really proud of them well he dies uh and then puts a lot of pressure on them because he says hey you know you it's on you now this is the, the fate of humanity is on your shoulders and so they're like yeah yeah we're totally gonna do that we completely are going to do that and then they go to a mall and do like a fashion show uh they get like different clothes on and they do like lightsaber jokes and stuff uh so yeah and it seems really strange uh that they have this important mission and they're doing that they leave the mall and like a mustang that his dad used to have like it looks like the same mustang or something like that but it's a mustang it's like an old classic like 69 mustang or something like that or 66 uh, but the alien tracks them down on a bridge, but they manage to knock the alien off the bridge, and the car crashes into him. But like Alex, because he's dumb, somehow lost track of the key, so it's still in the car. And so someone's got to climb down the bridge, and they gotta they gotta get it while the alien's there, regenerating. And it's Darius because he's overcoming his cowardice or whatever it is, and he does it. And then they go to the place where they're supposed to go, where the scientist is, and he's dead, like pretty much everybody else in that place. But Fortunately, uh, they're still able to communicate with Black Manta's dad from Aquaman, who is apparently a high-ranking military official, and he tells them how to send the signal that needs to be sent in order for this special key slash uh, project to actually work. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, uh, all the kids have to do something special. At one point, Alex has to confront fire. Gabriel has to do something with numbers, yada, yada, yada. They save the day, and apparently all their parents are alive, or at least the ones that were alive, you know, ahead of time. And so that's it. That's that's the movie. Is that is that about right? Is that about, is that about right? You, you're still with me? You still with me, Justin? Yeah, it was pretty awful. Um, so one of the things I saw early on is all the camp counselors are all Instagram influencers, and like Instagram, <laughs> like quote unquote comedians. Yeah. So when I saw that, I'm like, this is gonna be terrible. So here we go. Like the the black council, so like the black handshake and all stuff. He's like an Instagram comedian, oh, and he? what that means in Instagram is you're attractive and you make jokes that would work on Vine that aren't very funny, but you hang out with other attractive people, so people like your stuff. Like the oh. female counselor is Amanda Kearney, okay. and she's like a a really big Instagram model, and she thinks she's funny, but she's really not. She's just a very attractive woman and people wow. you know like follow her because of that not because of her comedy as wow well. listen listen to you listen to you like an attractive She's woman not funny. Funny. Uh, i didn't know any of that i don't know anything about insta and whatnot uh i did think that the first guy was kind of funny at times with black handshake he did some funny things uh but there was a certain point where like it, it, i don't know it got like there was, it was one of those movies that was like hey take us seriously right now and then at other times it's like except don't take us seriously now but and also take us seriously now for? like it doesn't make any sense <laughs> that's like, the other thing i was gonna get the to the kids are like 11 12 years yeah. old yeah. but like the way they talk and the way they act is like they're 16 17 18 it doesn't make any sense yeah and there's a lot of like questionable content in here too there's like tons of violence right there's often there's like really serious themes there's a lot of sexual stuff like really cringy jokes like it's 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 weirdly i can't figure out like that either it's like what's the age range for this but they're all prepubescent i know like, i know yeah it's really strange and, and I don't know, the, the part where darius went up to the woman who was like saying could just just can you just put it in and he's like all confused because he yeah thinks, I think I, I, just, immediately yeah. i was like okay yeah this is weird i don't like this because... yeah it was it was really cringy at times yeah very much very much because the kid's like 11 like yeah. that's really weird 
Yeah. Yeah, it was super cringy. Uh, it wasn't wholesome funny. Like at, I mean, at times, I guess it was. Like I, w- I want to say it was all bad because it wasn't all bad. Like there were some good moments here and there. Like, but like overall, I don't know. I just didn't like it. Like I, I it felt like it dragged for me. Like I made a kind of an offhand joke. It was an, it was an hour and a half, but it felt like longer. And I, I, I stand by that because it, it felt like there were scenes in there that were super unnecessary. The whole like. The creepy guy in the jail cell later into the scene where he shows up magically in the same spot as them. I'm not sure how that happened with a bunch of other people with creepy serial killer masks. Like I was watching something, you know, from that one movie where the purge, like it was like they had purge masks on. I'm like, what the hell is this? And they happen to find him. It's just like, seriously, why is this scene in here? Like this is both of these things. Like you could have taken both of those things out. I think it would have been a better movie because it would have been faster. Uh, and you wouldn't, yeah, it just, it was super, super strange. Um, I mean, like, there's good messages. You know, there's the kids work together. Like, even though Darius is really annoying for a very long time, he eventually overcomes his cowardice, and he kind of, like, kind of, you know, quote, man's up or cowboy's up, whatever it is you want to use. And he goes and he confronts the, the alien to get the to get the thing, and he gets away despite being, you know, severely injured. Gabriel overcomes his problems with numbers because Darius actually helps him, which is a big thing because Darius never really connected with anybody. Uh, Alex, like, climbs up uh, this long uh, antenna that he has to mess with, and he was very scared of heights in the very beginning when he was almost went on a zip line, so he kind of overcame that. And then he killed the alien with some fire, and then the room got caught on fire, and he freaked out, and he had memories of his dad. So all that kind of stuff was cool. Zen Zen is totally uh, underdeveloped. Like, all we knew of was a was a postcard, and her dad wanted a son, and that is it. That's all we got from her. Like, all the other, all the boys got some some semblance of development at the end, and I felt like they really dropped the ball on her, so that was kind of sad. Um. But yeah, you know, I just, I, I don't think it's good enough. Like it's, yeah, it's on Netflix. Yeah. I mean, it, most people have Netflix accounts, I, I suppose, and they're going to watch it and stuff, but no, I don't know. Things. I don't know. Like I, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend it. I, I don't, I'm sorry. Like I want to, I want to be nice, uh, but I, I just don't think it was all that good. All right. So you ready for your questions then? I am not, uh, but I will, I will try anyway. All right. So first question, what type of folds get no creases? What type of folds get no creases? I thought you said there were softballs in this. Oh, the rest are (laughs) softballs. Then it's not a softball. The rest are pretty much softballs. I don't have one that was legit, right? What kind of folds get no creases? Um, hmm. It's really early in the movie. It's when. uh, Oh, no, I'm sure it is. Yeah, it sounds like something in the beginning. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't have an answer. They are retail folds. That's the type of folds that get no creases in clothes. Okay. When you fold. Okay. Let me... That's the only hard one. I swear to God. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a good. Okay. I was watching this movie. I'm like, this is awful. I don't want to give them hard stuff. Okay. All right. Next one you actually got right already. So why Sweet. does Lou want the key? That's because mm-hmm. he wants to sell for money. And cool. you already got that one already. Nice. All right. So That's you're already creepy... one on one. Yeah. I'm already one on one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. There's a moment where they all kind of sit there and like talk about themselves and they describe themselves as something. How do they all describe themselves? Like, so what's the, the, like, who are we? You know, they had that little moment and they all say something. So what did they all say? They So all four of them describe themselves as one word uh, and like what people think they are, but what they are not defined by. So like, it was like a little powerful moment. Like, do they all have something different? Is this like, or they're all like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I don't. All right, so... The little ginger kid. Said wow. Whoa. Hey, there's no need for that. Sorry, my bad. There's no my need bad. for that. His name is Alex. You can call, you can use use his name. So Alex says he's a nerd. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes the sense. The one that they found in the woods, he calls himself a criminal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's starting the, to come back now. Yeah, yeah. The little Asian girl says she's an orphan. Okay. Do you remember what the annoying kid said? If you can remember what the annoying kid said, you will... <laughs> you will you will get all your points for this. Oh my gosh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I tried so hard. To I know you totally did. You totally did. All right. So the last one, he said that he was a joke. So oh, was yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So last one great CGI or greatest CGI? So we mentioned Andromeda. Okay. Now, Andromeda. Not only is it dated, uh, but it's also uh, Kevin Sorbo. So you know, not the highest CGI, right? Like, the Herc. Yeah, you know, I like to call him the Herc. Right. 
I would put this on par with Andromeda. Okay. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Not the greatest uh, at all. It was edited on an <laughs> iPhone with some type of app. No, it was it was not good, man. Like the uh, yeah, it wasn't good. Just uh, the opening yeah. sequence alone, I'm like, what the hell is this? It was like Spike. I felt like I was watching. I was playing a video game from like 2004, and I was like going through a cutscene, you know, something like that. It, yeah, it wasn't great. It wasn't. It wasn't good. All right, all right. I'll, I'll accept that one because it is not the greatest. Uh, I think we all agree that the greatest CGI of all time is probably i don't know hercules we can't sorbo oh or, or yeah, 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 yeah. hercules we can't sorbo i'll go with that too <laughs> anytime they show some type of harpy or something yeah i'll go with that yeah all right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so great cgi you're absolutely right so you got two out of four okay. all right for a really terrible show i try my best to give you three out of four try yeah, you best. were you were pretty you were you were surprisingly kind i, I didn't think you would tried be my kind. best for a garbage movie the best is like you sent me a, a text when i was up in colorado you go uh just give me three out of five this movie's terrible i don't want you to <laughs> yeah try to negotiate a score i'm like well, why would you skip the quiz so i don't can I, so bad I, I was like 40 minutes into the movie i'm like i can't take it man <laughs> yeah i feel bad i hate doing this kind of stuff i hate hating on things so bad like this because like I don't know. People made it. They put their hard work into it. But like ultimately, it just wasn't that great of a movie. I'm, I'm sorry to say. All right. So it's my turn. Yeah, Justin, why don't you tell the audience the, the wonderful piece of fiction that uh, you, got to, uh, you got to partake in? The movie you assigned to me is the 1984 <laughs> classic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. I don't even set up to work great. Uh, it seems Streets fitting. of Fire. Yeah, baby. Directed by Walter Hill, who's also the writer or the writer and director for 48 Hours. Yeah, that's a good movie. And, and The Warriors. Also All a good, good movie. Movies. Yeah. So, um, it stars Diane Lane. So, I actually like what you said in your description. You talked about uh, Black Mantis' dad. Because I'm going to refer every character in this movie not by their character's name, but by what they've played in other movies. Is so you have mom? Diane Lane. Yeah. Superman's mom. Okay. You have Willem Dafoe. Uh, who do you think I'm going to call him? Green Goblin. Green Goblin. Green Goblin. Yeah. Absolutely. Rick Moranis. What is he going to be? Uh, oh, man. He could be a lot of different things. Uh, oh, there's only one good one. What are you talking about, man? He's got you got Ghostbusters. You got, uh, what's it called? Uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, man. I went with Keymaster. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ghostbusters. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so. Overall, first off, what about Michael Para? What are you talking about, man? Eddie and the Cruisers? I, I don't know what the hell he's been in. He's I been in. He's been in Eddie and the Cruisers. Is what he's been in. That's what he's been. So, in. So, uh, the music in this movie is stellar, as you can hear uh, right now. Uh, so it's like a '50s noir, almost kind of thing, but it also has '80s music. So it kind of broke my brain a little bit because I'm like, is this takes place in the '50s or the '80s? I don't know because you get like greasers but then it's also like the first song in this movie is when i sent you that message i'm like this is the greatest music of all time so it's just so 80s um it is. so i wrote down the plot and the story piece by piece because i knew this needed to be documented properly all right so i because it's such a great movie and i'm saying this with a, a grain of salt because it's really not that great but it's ridiculous so, um so willem dafoe kidnaps sorry my bad green goblin kidnaps superman's mom she's a singer in a club he just shows up with his biker gang the bombers and he kidnaps superman's mom okay a letter is sent out to tom who is the the lead of the movie um and my note i put for this needs a shave because he neither has a five o'clock shadow nor a full beard he has that like uh joe dirt white trashy facial hair going on it's real bad it doesn't look good well, there here we get here we get so a letter sent out to tom to come back uh home tom was in i guess the army and uh one of the other notes i put in here is the most uh incompetent cops ever in a movie uh they, he like steals a car Drives it around, they pull him over, and they're like, hey, get out of here, kid. I mean, it's just really bad. So, Tom then goes to the bar and meets uh, one of the soldiers from Aliens, 
uh, Bill Paxton. Uh, and he doesn't say game over, man, which is uh, disappointing. And when he's at the bar, he miss, meets a woman named McCoy, who's also from the military, who subsequently knocks out Bill Paxton at the bar because she's tough and she ain't no dame. She ain't no skirt, which they're called multiple times. McCoy goes back with Tom to his house, stays the night. Tom goes to save uh, Superman's uh, mother because they used to have a relationship. And he teams up with McCoy and her manager, who is played by the Keymaster. Okay. Her manager offers Tom $10,000 to go save Superman's mother. So the Keymaster is kind of like dating her and also is like her manager. Okay. They track down the bikers, the bomber gang, back to their lair. And the lair is called uh, Torches. All right. And at that point, the proverbial shit hits the fan. They start blowing stuff up. They get Superman's mother out of there. Much better job than when Batman did it in uh, Batman vs. Superman. Uh, really good job getting her out of that uh, dusty old station. They get kind of chased out of it. And there's a music interlude for no reason. Because they need to have music throughout this thing. 80s and 50s music. It's a um, rock and roll adventure. You gotta, gotta, gotta have music, man. Yeah, obviously. Okay. They steal a bus from Meteor Man and one of the FBI agents from uh, Die Hard. Um, there were two of the uh, singers in the, the soul band. I don't know if you noticed that Meteor Man and the FBI agent, the, like the, they had like the same name. I forget what their names were in Die Hard. So anyways, they steal the bus from them. They take the bus and get pulled over by the cops. They threaten to kill the cops, blow up the cop cars, then get on a train, all right? When they, they make it back to town, the Green Goblin shows up and says, I want to fight Tom hand-to-hand -hand by myself. And if you guys don't give me him one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to mess up the town. The cop then comes and tells him he needs to skip town and he'll deal with it. Tom starts to skip town and in the process with a Superman's mom. Uh, he uh, oh, Hold on first. He, he goes, he tells me to skip town. Tom then goes and sees the key master, right, to get his money. Uh, Superman's mom is very upset with Tom because she's upset that he came and saved her for money, even though she was going to probably be raped and killed in the situation. But she's just upset that they involved money. So then he comes back to collect his money. He takes a thousand for McCoy because he promised McCoy a thousand, but then throws the other nine thousand back at the key master and he leaves. And then Superman's mom follows him out in the rain. And they have a pointless kiss that makes no sense. And then there's a sex scene, kind of, that doesn't make any sense either. All right? It's all kind of, like, nonsensical why all these things happened. I don't understand why you say it doesn't make sense. I mean, whenever I'm in the rain, uh, I like to stay in that heavy rain and make out. Because that's I mean, yeah. there's nothing better than that. And then right? they have, like, a post-sex talk where they're still just as wet as when they were in the rain. You think at a certain point they dry off a little bit. Anyways, or maybe it was just really great stuff. So, after that, they then get on the train to skip town, and then he leaves the train by punching Diane Lane in the face, not just, like, leaving, but straight up knocks her out in the most, I don't know. like, ridiculous <laughs> I way I've ever seen this movie. I don't think the saxophone rip was the right loop for that. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it punches her dead in the jaw and knocks her out, okay? He then goes back to the town. And the cops uh, are there for Green Goblin. Green Goblin shows up and says, where's Tom? And he goes, well, he's gone. We're not going to deal with it. If you guys want to get out of here, we're going to take you to jail. And then all the other bombers show up. And, like, all these guys with guns show up. And then Tom shows up and says, guys, I'm here to help out. And who's there says, my thing didn't work. You try your thing. And then, next scene, sledgehammer fight. All right? Not just the fight. Sledgehammer fight. And there's a big old sledgehammer fight between Green Goblin and Tom. And what I put for uh, uh, a note here is great teeth acting by Willem Dafoe. Because um, there's lots of moments where he's all teeth and a big old mouth. Because he's got a big old mouth. Um, and uh, Did you see the, the end, you see the part where he twitches? When he first gets yeah, there? Like, <laughs> his cheek twitches. It's so good. Then he wins. So Tom wins, beats up Green Goblin. The rest of town comes out with all their guns, and it's ridiculous how many guns are on the street. And they kick the bombers out of the city, 
and uh, Tom's the hero, but he leaves because he's just too cool for school. He can't stick around. And then Superman's mom goes back on stage and you end with a great musical finale where it says, I can't dream without you. Um, I believe that's a Lionel Richie song though. I don't know if it was created by them, but uh, I was dancing pretty good. Uh, and then uh, Superman's mom has a song and it's super awesome. Cool. Cause the, the souls uh, help out too. And uh, my last note here is flawless movie. There's not a single I agree with that. I love this movie. I haven't seen this movie in like 20 years. Uh, and I no, saw it's it. not great, but it's, it's for amazing. 80s nostalgia. It's no, it's, it's great. Fantastic. It's great. So I saw one of the dudes I follow on Twitter. He was talking about it and said, so gave me the idea. Uh, but I saw my wife afterwards. I'm like, you know what? You know, what? I love the eighties, you know, because there were some crazy bonkers ideas for movies. Like just, this is a nuts just idea. what the hell is this? Now I'm not going to say like all the movies were successful. Of course they were. There were plenty of like stinkers for sure, but I don't know. I just feel we live in an age right now where like movies are constantly being, I just mentioned big trouble in little China is being redone. And there's so many other movies that are being redone. I mean, we got a brand new Batman that we just announced. How like, much Coke was in those like okay. rooms where there were green light movies. Cause it's know. just crazy. I don't know. Maybe I they see. were, maybe they were a Pepsi room. Who knows? Right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Family you're right. Yeah. How much Coca Cola was in those rooms? Yeah. I don't know. All I know is that I love '80s movies for how crazy they were, even when they're bad. Like, and I think there's something about the weirdness to them that I, I just, I have, I always have a nostalgic bent for. Even if I didn't even see them in the '80s, even if I didn't see them until like the '90s or the 2000s, I still think back. I'm like, oh man, man, that was a crazy. good example. Of that is, I went, I was in a class. One of my colleagues' classes, he, he was at the end of the year, he didn't have anything left, and they were watching Footloose. And you really think about the story of Footloose and how ridiculous it is and how it makes no sense. What do you mean it doesn't um, make any really... sense, man? What do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean it doesn't make any sense? There's a small town where dancing is outlawed. And yeah. then a young that kid. Alone, that should have been like. I don't. An, I, that should have been makes perfect sense. Me, no. That's not, Get out of my room. That makes... <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? It makes perfect sense. And yeah. then a young kid. Room. Is going to come there and he's going to teach or he's going to lead these these poor oppressed people and to uh, dancing. Do, 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 do. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's, Careful. We don't. So uh, that's I don't. That's royalties. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. All the other ones I was but doing was Creative Commons. <laughs> Be careful. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, Streets of Fire. Uh, if you like 80s ridiculousness, you got to watch it. It's on par with like the warriors and it's all so those other fun. kind of like it's such a ridiculous fun types of if you're a person who likes to have fun and you and you you don't have a stick up your butt uh then you should watch this movie because the really most fun. ridiculous part is when he knocks out diane lane it's just i'm like it, what <laughs> why <laughs> i know i know and he t- i know i can't even it's <laughs> it just hands her over to amy madigan and like here take this <laughs> I gotta get off. All right, so you got questions for me? Yeah, I got some questions. Uh, You alluded to one, but you didn't get it right. So I'm gonna give you another opportunity. Uh, You kind of bailed on it in your summary. When and where is this movie set? I, it's it's so amalgus. I don't know. I'm gonna say it's in Chicago. It looks like um, because of the raised platform train, and I think it takes place in. 1960. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Uh, the correct answer was shown right towards the beginning of the movie, uh, as the as the credits were rolling in the opening, and it says, Those "Great transitions." It was set in another time, in another place. That's okay. Correct answer. <laughs> All right. Another okay. time, okay. another place. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so Justin, you and I think very similarly sometimes, and uh, your your way of referring to people by what other movies do we know them from is exactly where I was going with question number two. However, in your long litany of references, you did not reference the one that I was asking you about. So what top gun pilot played a cop in this movie? Oh, that was, um, I knew I recognized him from something. He was top gun. That's Iceman's wingman. I'm going to need to know so, his sorry. call sign, please. Uh, okay. So it's, Maverick was a main one. Then you got Goose, Iceman, mm-hmm. Merlin was the one in charge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh boy. Oh boy. 
If you uh, listen closely, you can hear the clicking of Justin's keyboard. Was it Cougar? It was not Cougar. No, not Cougar. What are you talking about, man? It was Slider. A slider. Slider. That's the dumbest name out of all. <laughs> Played by Rick Rosovich. Uh, Rick Rosovich. Oh, man. I knew I recognized that guy from something. I just okay. couldn't remember what it was. Okay, so uh, interesting question. You, you talked about how how effective uh, how effective Tom was at um, getting Diane Lane's character. How about freeing her uh, from within the uh, imprisonment that she was facing? What I'm curious about, because like if you think about the plan, he was going in from the top. Amy Madigan was coming in from the bottom, and she somehow gets into their poker room and she points a gun at them, and then she's there for a minute, and then she just leaves at the perfect time. My question for you is, how did Amy Madigan know right when Michael Parra had actually freed Diane Lane? Because that's when she moves. Yet they don't have cell phones or anything. They didn't have a timer. They didn't, work. they didn't like synchronize their swatches. They just, she just knew. She just left at the perfect time. Jeff, so, so when how? you're in the military, okay? When you're in the military, I've played plenty of Call of Duty. So it's I basically the same thing, I believe. Yeah. yeah. When you're in the military, there's like this thing sense you have as to when you've accomplished the mission most of the time i know this in call of duty because it says it on the screen so i'm sure it says the same thing to them when they're doing stuff so i think in the process of him freeing her it says something like you've acquired the package in her head and that means she had to go so that's my answer to that so it's something like that something like call because that's all i know about wow forces. that is incredibly close to the answer uh i actually <laughs> wrote she probably heard like the voice in her head say checkpoint reached. Uh, so <laughs> you gotta, you gotta give it I'm to gonna you. give it to you. I mean, that's pretty damn close to what I had. So yeah, I'm gonna give it to All you right. for sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, so Justin, um, this isn't even a question for points, but I just really want to get your feed. I got a couple more, but I just want to get your feedback as I prep this next question. Why the hell has Willem Dafoe never been the Joker? Right. That's a good question. Gosh. He's got the perfect face for the he Joker. He doesn't even need makeup, man. He's got plenty like, of teeth, too. It's insane. Like Anyway, so how does the final fight, uh, which is the duel between Willem Dafoe and Michael Parr, rank, Sledgehammer fight. rank in comparison to the best fight sequences slash duels of all time? So I would like, say, your top three and maybe where Streets of Fire rest within that so, top three. So uh, Duel of Fates, obviously, is a big duel. Um uh, it was a big moment for me as a child watching Darth Maul fight two Jedi at once with a double side lightsaber. That's a big one. So that's got to be one of the top three. Uh, obviously, Streets of Fire is up there. Um, and I believe the final fight in Equilibrium is pretty solid too. So, because uh, I actually like that gun, gung fu, gun fu thing that they do. So I'm going to say um, second. So first would be Duel, Duel of uh, Fates with uh, Star Wars, right? Darth Maul. And then you'd say uh, Sledgehammer Fight, because I've never seen Sledgehammer Fight in any other movie ever, and I don't think it should ever be replicated. And then I'd have to say Equilibrium uh, uh, Gun Fu Fight. So that would be my orders right there. The Equilibrium one was really off the board. I thought there was a good chance you were going to mention some sort of Jedi thing. I thought maybe you'd go Revenge of the Sith um, I'm gonna have to just qualify your answer though, because Darth Maul oh, fought no. fought two Jedi, so it's not really a duel. Oh, uh, you're right. So I'm, fair, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna have to. We call that. that a handicap match. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like the table eyes and chair match. Yeah. I would like to see Darth Maul do that as well. All right. So, uh, final question, Justin. Um, saxophones. Uh, what happened to okay. them in mainstream music? Like what? I mean, why There's aren't they enough. a thing? I don't understand. Like, what happened? What happened? There's not enough. There needs to be more. Um, I can only assume that the horn. So the horns are collected from a rare beast. And I believe that they were almost hunted to extinction in the 80s. Um, so they've been kind of protected. So there hasn't been any new saxophones built since 1987. So it's kind of hard to get them in mainstream uh, bands these days. That's one of the big reasons, I think. Um, there's a really great documentary on Netflix about the uh, Horned Mbatu. Um, mm. and, uh, it's about uh, the saxophone poaching in uh, South Africa. <laughs> so you should really, uh, really look that up. So that's probably the main reason. 
you know what, Justin, that's exactly correct. I have the I, I have the documentary like right here. Like if he mentions documentary, give Man, me my, my yes ending is uh my it's, yes ending is really on fire today. It's got... pretty it's pretty amazing. So you're gonna get you're gonna get two out of six, I think it was. Oh my god. So while you got the same amount right as me, you only gave me four questions, so percentage wise I still beat you. But so all is right with the world. Everything's fine. Uh, but very impressive. Very impressive. Just you know, right. yeah. Not everyone has the ability to get one third of the questions right all the time. But I am willing to say that I more often than not get that, and I'm proud of my abilities. So. You know, when we first started this podcast, I I had it in my mind to track our scores the whole time. It's pointless, and that's like pointless. so much work. Uh, maybe one day we'll go back and do it. We can do that right now, okay? Uh, <laughs> I like think I'm eighty-five winning. for you, and mm-hmm. then like, or no, from like one hundred and ten for you, and yeah. like. I don't know, twelve for me. I think you're. I think you're better than that. I think. I think you're probably in the maybe in the. Thanks, 40s. man. I think you're in the forties. I think you're in the forties. Right. Right. Something like that. Yeah. All right, Justin, you ready for new challenges? You, what, I have. I got some got? choices for you. Okay. So bring them. Uh, bring. What do you got? There's three here. Okay. One is an insult to what we like to do a lot. It's uh, it's a gaming movie. All right. So you got that one. Uh, is it the original there, Super Mario Bros? No, I thought about giving that though, but I didn't want you to spend four dollars on. I uh, I went to that movie in theaters on a field trip with my middle school. I went to that movie in 1993 after I got too scared of Jurassic Park, and my mother took me out of it to go to uh, see Super Mario Brothers, and she never forgave me for it because uh, very different types of movies. Is that why she moved away from you? (laughs) It's why she's in Sarasota. Yes. All right. What else? All right. So do you have a comic book movie? Um, and I warn you, it is amazing. Now, when you say um, comic movie, you, is it a superhero comic or is it just a comic? Uh, superhero comic, okay. uh, kind of. It's it's uh, amalgamous, if you will. And the last one is is uh, something new on Hulu. It's kind of spooky. So, which one would you like to watch? I'll say Hulu then. All right. So there's they they come oh uh what's it they come knocking. They that's what it is knocking yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah sure i, th- I would probably watch the other one was spawn because i love i wanted i haven't I seen a movie in like 20 years and yeah. it's really great speaking of hey i said mara and it's like that's john Leguizamo. he's in both of them right it's got Jalal white in it too it's pretty great okay justin uh for you um i'm not sure if you ever saw this movie uh i like from from you ever you know the the kurt russell is one of my all time yeah, favorite. I mean, I mentioned Big Trouble in Little China. He's seen so many other things. I like The Thing, etc. Uh, uh, Captain York, Ron. So I've seen Captain Ron. Sure, yeah. Captain Ron. Right, right. But he was also in the best firefighter movie of all Backdraft? time. Backdraft? In which the wonderful phrase was uttered, you go, we go. Right, which is which is great, and like honestly, that's what I think about when I think about this podcast. Right, you know, like we're <laughs> we're that kind of team. So in honor of that, I would like you to watch the best firefighter movie sequel called Backdraft 2, which is available wait, wait, on wait, Netflix. Wait a minute. And apparently has like Billy Baldwin and Donald Sutherland in it. I'm like, how bad are your well, careers? Well, Baldwin Brothers was in the first one, wasn't it? Uh, it, was Billy, it was Billy. Yeah, Billy Baldwin oh, was in the first. God. Donald Sutherland was in the first. And apparently they're back again. So I would like you to watch Backdraft 2. Which is oh, on boy. which is on Netflix now. It just came off a couple weeks ago or something like that. It's uh, coming left and out of nowhere, right, right there. It's... I I think I think you're gonna dig it. I think you're gonna dig it. Did you really? <laughs> I wanted to do like a, I have in my notes. I'm like set it up, set it up to make it think that he's actually gonna watch a good movie, <laughs> and then I just completely take it away from you. All right, Justin. So we've got our new challenges. I guess I guess it's time to close this episode down. Don't you think? So yeah. If you like what you're hearing uh, and you're listening to us on iTunes or some other system, give us a like or a subscribe, maybe a couple stars, maybe a review, anything like that. If you want to catch us on uh, on the old social media, you can catch me on uh, on Twitter at Co. Justin's at Buys Justin. We've been using the wrong Twitter for the longest time for him because he's dumb. It's at Buys Justin. All right. Uh, we, we were doing like JD Buys for something. All right. right. It's Buys Justin. Uh, okay. So, Justin, if there were a great movie in the past... Uh, that you've seen before, that you think Netflix should make a terrible sequel to, what movie would it be? Uh, Tommy Boy Two. I, there's what? no, there's no way well, yeah. that that would be successful in any way. Sure. 
I mean, and it is probably my favorite movie of all time. So, so Tommy Boy Two would have to be. All right, all right. So Tommy Boy Two, I think I would like, I would like to see a, I would want to see a sequel to Willow. Oh God! Right. Let's do that. Willow Two, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> every every sequel should have that subtitle. Yeah. Testing here.